America. My name is Dylan John, and you are listening to Nature and the Nation. For today's episode, I will be looking at The Revolt of the Masses by Jose Ortega y Gasset. And as seems to be common practice, uh, I'm going to simply refer to the author as Ortega. Uh, the book was written in 1930 in Spanish and was translated by nobody knows who. The translator remains anonymous at the translator's request. The English version seems to have been released in 1932, so it was very quickly translated into English. Nearly a hundred years old. Uh, and it's a pretty good book, although like most of the books that I review, there's some things in here that I disagree with, which I'll point out, and many things in here that I agree with. Um, very interesting stuff, though. Uh, as is often the case with these books that were written so long ago, uh, there are parts of it that are uncannily relevant to our modern world, and there are other parts of it that always have to be looked at a little bit skeptically, knowing that this was written nearly a hundred years ago, and what we refer to now may not mean exactly the same thing as it refer the the phrase or word referred to back then. The circumstances that he's describing are not circumstances that we live in. We have to kind of infer the way, you know, from our knowledge of history and from what he's describing, uh, the way things were when he's, you know, in the in the world in which he's describing. So we always have to sort of keep in the back of our minds that the world he's describing is not the world we live in, although it remains very similar, and some things just don't ever seem to change. So uh, I won't get into a tremendous amount about Ortega y Gasset. Uh, he's not really a part of any particular philosophical uh, school of thought. Um, he writes philosophy as well as political, uh, on political topics. This is much more on a political topic than a philosophical topic, but, um, there's certainly also maybe some philosophical components to what he's writing about. At any rate, he's writing about, uh, it's called the revolt of the masses. He's really talking about the rise of the masses, the rise of the mass man, as he refers to it as a, a player on the, on the European stage uh, that hasn't always had the role he has now. So he's kind of describing the rise of the mass man and it's coming into power. So like all of my episodes, I'm going to be reading some sections here and then commenting on the sections I've read. Uh, I've got a lot in this one I want to read. I have eight sections and some of them are kind of long, so it's probably going to be more reading in this episode than perhaps some other ones. Um, but it's worth it. It's it's good stuff, and I'm I'm going through all through from the very first uh, chapter to one of the last, with various sections that I think are the most important and uh, the most important for our modern age, as well as the most important sections in understanding the point that he's making in the book. So I'm going to start reading a section here from chapter one. He's laying out his terms and describing what exactly he's talking about. This is kind of the basic, uh, the basic section that will give us, you know, the framework for the rest of the book. So in this section, he says, quote, the concept of the multitude is quantitative and visual. Without changing its nature, let us translate it into terms of sociology. We then meet with the notion of the social mass. Society is always a dynamic unity of two component factors, minorities and masses. The minorities are individuals or groups of individuals which are specially qualified. The mass is the assemblage of persons not specially qualified. By masses, then, it is not to be understood solely or mainly the working masses. The mass is the average man. In this way, what was merely quantity 
the multitude, is converted into a qualitative determination. It becomes the common social quality, man as undifferentiated from other men, but as repeating in himself a generic type. What have we gained by this conversion of quantity into quality? Simply this. By means of the latter, we understand the genesis of the former. It is evident to the verge of platitude that the normal foundation of a multitude implies the coincidence of desires, ideas, ways of life in the individuals who constitute it. It will be objected that this is just what happens with every social group, however select it may strive to be. This is true, but there is an essential difference. In those groups which are characterized by not being multitude and mass, the effective coincidence of its members is based on some desire, idea, or ideal which of itself excludes the great number. To form a minority of whatever kind is necessary beforehand that each member separate himself from the multitude for special, relatively personal reasons. Their coincidence with the others who form the minority is then secondary, posterior to their having each adopted an attitude of singularity, and is consequently to a large extent a coincidence in not coinciding. There are cases in which this singularizing character of the group appears in the light of day. Those English groups which style themselves nonconformists, where we have the grouping together of those who agree only in their disagreement in regard to the limitless multitude. The coming together of the minority precisely in order to separate themselves from the majority is a necessary ingredient in the formation of every minority. Speaking of the limited public which listened to a musician of refinement, Mallarmé wittily says that this public, by his, its presence in small numbers, stressed the absence of the multitude. Strictly speaking, the mass, as a psychological fact, can be defined without waiting for individuals to appear in mass formation. In the presence of one individual, we can decide whether he is mass or not. The mass is all that which sets no value on itself, good or ill, based on specific grounds, but which feels itself just like everybody, and nevertheless is not concerned about it, is, in fact, quite happy to feel itself as one with everybody else. Imagine a humble-minded man who, having tried to estimate his own worth on specific grounds, asking himself if he, if he has any talent for this or that, if he excels in any direction, realizes that he possesses no quality of excellence. Such a man will feel that he is mediocre and commonplace, ill-gifted, but will not feel himself mass. When one speaks of select minorities, it is usual for the evil-minded to twist this sense of this expression, pretending to be unaware that the select man is not the petulant person who thinks himself superior to the rest, but the man who demands more of himself than the rest, even though he may not fulfill in his person those higher exigencies. For there is no doubt that the most radical division that it is possible to make of humanity is that which splits it into two classes of creatures. Those who make great demands on themselves, piling up difficulties and duties, and those who demand nothing special of themselves but for whom to live is to be every moment what they already are, without imposing on themselves any effort toward perfection, mere buoys that float on the waves. This reminds me that Orthodox Buddhism is composed of two distinct religions, one more rigorous and difficult, the other easier and more trivial. The Mahayana, great vehicle or great path, and the Hinayana, lesser vehicle or lesser path. The decisive matter is whether we attach our life to one or the other vehicle, to a maximum or minimum of demands upon ourselves. The division of society into masses and select minorities is then not a division into social classes, but into classes of men, and cannot coincide with the hierarchical separation of upper and lower classes. It is, of course, plain that in these upper classes, when and as long as they really are so, there is much more likelihood of finding men who adopt the great vehicle, whereas the lower classes normally comprise individuals of minus quality. But strictly speaking, within both these social classes there are to be found mass, and a genuine minority. As we shall see, a characteristic of our times is the predominance, even in groups traditionally selective, of the mass and the vulgar. Thus, in the intellectual life, which of its essence requires and presupposes qualification, 
one can note the progressive triumph of the pseudo-intellectual, unqualified, unqualifiable, and by their very mental texture, disqualified. Similarly, in the surviving groups of the nobility, male and female. On the other hand, it is not rare to find today amongst working men, who before might be taken as the best example of what we are calling mass, nobly disciplined minds. There exists then in society operations, activities, and functions of the most diverse order, which are of their very nature special, and which consequently cannot be properly carried out without special gifts. For example, certain pleasures of an artistic and refined character, or again the functions of government and of political judgment in public affairs. Previously, these special activities were exercised by qualified minorities, or at least by those who claimed such qualification. The mass asserted no right to intervene in them. They realized that if they wished to intervene, they would necessarily have to acquire those special qualities and cease being mere mass. They recognized their place in a healthy, dynamic social system. End quote. Okay, so there's my, uh, there's my opening section, a couple pages long. Like I said, some of these sections I'm reading are fairly long, but here you're seeing basically the division of society into a select minority and the, and the greater general mass of people. He says it's not an issue of upper class and lower class, although one would expect a preponderance of more of the select minorities among the upper classes, um, but it is entirely possible that there are people of upper classes or of even of the intellectual pursuits who really are, by every definition, mass man. And there are people of the working classes who are more nobly disciplined minds, he said, who really make up uh, the select minority. And he really says that it comes down to uh, expectations that one puts upon oneself. So people who demand more of themselves to become expert in something. I mean, in, in many ways, he's talking about experts, people who have a degree of expertise, like toward the end when he talks about artistic pursuits or political pursuits. These are, uh, he says, well, he says there are operations and activities which are of their nature special and they can't be properly carried out without special gifts. Pleasures of an artistic and refined character or the functions of government, political judgment, these special activities were exercised by qualified minorities, people who are trained or have trained themselves, who have striven to improve themselves, to become more than they currently are, to exceed themselves and excel in a certain field. Those are the people who are experts and those are the people who uh, are making decisions and are acting within certain spheres. And so it's really a sort of aristocratic approach. And again, it's not a matter of a certain hereditary class of people who are just automatically set to rule, but in some sense, he's advocating for rule by experts. Now, there's definitely like a populist part of um, the political right, which opposes rule by experts. And then there's a part of the political left that would also oppose rule by experts, and then there's a, a side that would support it. Um, Ortega y Gasset is generally considered a man of the right, and to have a sort of aristocratic uh, approach is by nature to stand against equality in some forms, that all people are equally qualified to do this or that, uh, you know, that we should be seeking out like skill in things like in art the sort of idea that like a lot of modern art seems like it you know any third grader could do it and and uh you know that may or may not be the case but the sense that these sorts of things should be you know evaluated as you know according to sort of hierarchies as some is better some of art is better than other art some political judgment is better than other political judgment people who are trained and who have spent their lives you know, becoming skilled in art will generally make better art. Now, obviously, there's a natural talent that's involved in these sorts of things. And the same thing with political judgments, there's a natural talent. And then there's a degree of education and training that one would expect somebody who's making political decisions to have. And you wouldn't necessarily say that all artwork is of equal value or of equal beauty. 
any more than you would necessarily say that everybody's political opinion is equally valid. And yet we, we, have, we live in a world in which we do say everyone's political opinion is equally valid, regardless of whether or not they know what they're talking about. They're just, you, you, that's democracy. You, you exist, therefore you have a vote. Your opinion is just as valuable as anyone else's opinion. And that's how we make our decisions as a country. We may put people into positions of authority like um, senators and representatives and presidents and things of that nature. Well, we get, you know, we, we, we have a representative democracy. So, but really we're voting on who it is who is most qualified to do that. But we're also voting on who it is that's going to en- enact the policies we support. So, you know, if you support, like a, say you have no, you don't really know anything about economics and you think $50 minimum wage That's really what everybody should be making. Let's put somebody in power who supports a $50 minimum wage if somebody comes up and says that's what they're going to do. And if enough people believe it, then that's who's going to win the election. So it is like we really do give the decision-making power of what we're going to do as a society to just average people. There's no expectation of any expertise. Um, and the same goes for like, um, for anything else where people just feel they have their, their opinion about this, that, or the other is just as valid as anybody else's opinion, whether they know what they're talking about or not. So he's really talking about the multitudes, the masses and the, and the, the fact that, you know, there's a distinction between people of the masses and the um and the and the select minorities now that section i read there doesn't go into much about the criticism of the current status of the masses and the minorities but more he's laying out the terms this is you know this is what the masses are this is what the select minorities are so now moving along to the second section here um he talks a little bit about population and how how it is that the mass man has come to uh, acquire so much power in the modern world, and he attributes a lot of that to um, the growing population. So here he says, quote, The mass man is he whose life lacks any purpose and simply goes drifting along. Consequently, though his possibilities and his powers be enormous, he constructs nothing. And it is this type of man who decides in our time. It will be well, then, that we analyze his character. The key to this analysis is found when, returning to the starting point of our essay, we ask ourselves, whence have come all these multitudes, which nowadays fill to overflowing the stage of history? Some years ago, the eminent economist Werner Sombart laid stress on a very simple fact, which I am surprised is not present to every mind which meditates on contemporary events. This very simple fact is sufficient of itself to clarify our vision of the Europe of today, or, if not sufficient, puts us on the road to enlightenment. The fact is this. From the time European history begins in the 6th century up to the year 1800, that is, through the course of 12 centuries, Europe does not succeed in reaching a total population greater than 180 million inhabitants. Now from 1800 to 1914, little more than a century, the population of Europe mounts from 180 to 460 million. I take it that the contrast between these figures leaves no doubt as to the prolific qualities of the last century. In three generations, it produces a gigantic mass of humanity, which, launched like a torrent over the historic area, has inundated it. This fact, I repeat, should suffice to make us realize the triumph of the masses, and all that is implied and announced by it. Furthermore, it should be added as the most concrete item to that rising of the level of existence which I have already indicated. But at the same time, this fact proves to us how unfounded is our admiration when we lay stress on the increase of new countries like the United States of America. We are astonished at this increase, which has reached to 100 million in a century, when the really astonishing fact is the teeming fertility of Europe. Here we have another reason for correcting the deceptive notion 
of the Americanization of Europe. Not even that characteristic which might seem specifically American, the rapidity of increase in population, is peculiarly such. Europe has increased in the last century much more than America. America has been formed from the overflow of Europe. But although this fact, ascertained by Werner Sombart, is not as well known as it should be, the confused idea of a considerable population increase in Europe was widespread enough to render unnecessary insistence on it. In the figures cited, then, it is not the increase of population which interests me, but the fact that, by the contrast with the previous figures, the dizzy rapidity of the increase is brought into relief. This is the point of importance for us at the moment, for that rapidity means that heap after heap of human beings have been dumped onto the historic scene at such an accelerated rate that it has been difficult to saturate them with traditional culture, and in fact, the average type of European at present possesses a soul, healthier and stronger it is true, than those of the last century, but much more simple. Hence, at times he leaves the impression of a primitive man, suddenly risen in the midst of a very old civilization. In the schools, which were such a source of pride in the last century, it has been impossible to do more than instruct the masses in the technique of modern life. It has been found impossible to educate them. They have been given tools for an intenser form of existence, but no feeling for their great historic duties. They have been hurriedly inoculated with the pride and power of modern instruments, but not with their spirit. Hence, they will have nothing to do with their spirit, and the new generations are getting ready to take over command of the world as if the world were a paradise, without trace of former footsteps, without traditional and highly complex problems. To the last century, then, falls the glory and the responsibility of having let loose upon the area of history the great multitudes. And this fact affords the most suitable viewpoint in order to judge that century with equity. There must have been something extraordinary, incomparable in it, when such harvests of human fruit were produced in its climate. Any preference for the principles which inspired other past ages is frivolous and ridiculous, if one does not previously show proof of having realized this magnificent fact and attempted to digest it. The whole of history stands out as a gigantic laboratory in which all possible experiments have been made to obtain a formula of public life most favorable to the plant man. And beyond all possible explaining away, we find ourselves face to face with the fact that by submitting the seed of humanity to the treatment of two principles, liberal democracy and technical knowledge, in a single century the species in Europe has been triplicated. Such an overwhelming fact forces us, unless we prefer not to use our reason, to draw these conclusions. First, that liberal democracy based on technical knowledge is the highest type of public life hitherto known. Secondly, that that type may not be the best imaginable, but the one we imagine as superior to it must preserve the essence of these two principles. And thirdly, that to return to any forms of existence inferior to that of the 19th century is suicidal. Once we recognize this with all the clearness that the clearness of the fact itself demands, we must then rise up against the 19th century. If it is evident that there was in it something extraordinary and incomparable, it is no less so that it must have suffered from certain radical vices, certain constitutional defects, when it brought into being a cast of men, the mass man in revolt, who are placing in imminent danger those very principles to which they owe their existence. If that human type continues to be master in Europe, 30 years will suffice to send our continent back to barbarism. Legislative and industrial technique will disappear with the same facility with which so many trade secrets have often disappeared. The whole of life will be contracted. The actual abundance of possibilities will change into practical scarcity, a pitiful impotence, a real decadence. For the rebellion of the masses is one and the same thing with what Rathenau called the vertical invasion of the barbarians. It is of great importance, then, to understand thoroughly this mass man with his potentialities of the greatest good and the greatest evil. End quote. Okay, so there are a number of sections here that I think are important. Some he just kind of goes on, but some that I think are pretty important. So the point he says, he says, 
we need to ask ourselves, where did all these multitudes of people come from? Uh, where did all these mass men come from? And he says that uh, up, up until the year 1800, the population of Europe was capped out at 180 million people, did not exceed 180 million. Then from 1800 to 1914, the population goes from 180 million to 460 million. That's a pretty big increase. More than double. Significantly more than doubled. And so... He says that even 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 so, the the rising of Europe, I mean the rising of America, the increase in population in America was largely driven by the overflow of people from Europe. So not only has it gone from 180 to 460, but it's also created a continual outflow of people into the United States. He says there's so many people coming up so fast, it hasn't been possible to properly educate them on the traditions, the problems, the techniques their position within history. They're just getting the basic tools necessary to get jobs and feed themselves and their families, but they're not being plugged into the civilization and their greater place within the civilization. Okay, so first of all, just from that alone, um, there's, a, there's a lot of talk about birth rates, uh, the birth rate in Europe and particularly the birth rate of Native Europeans being low um, Europe not having uh, enough children to replicate itself. Uh, and that's a problem in a sense, especially when you have these kind of booms and busts of population growth and you wind up with an aging population. Every effort is made to keep people alive for as long as possible. Um, every effort is made to shrink the number of children people have. And I've talked about that in previous episodes, all the various uh, progressive policies that all always seem coincidentally to have the effect of lowering and lowering and lowering the birth rate. Meanwhile, people are kept alive through every sort of physical problem uh, well into their 80s and 90s, etc. Uh, and so you have this huge aging population that's not working and uh, you know more and more taxation on younger people to pay for the older people. And, uh, you know, this can be seen as a problem of not having a high enough birth rate. And it's seen as sort of this catastrophe to have the birth rate low. It is a catastrophe in some senses, primarily in the sense that the rest of the world is not undergoing this same sort of problem. The, the other, I mean, there are countries in Africa with birth rate of like six point something kids per woman, which is insane. Um... I won't get into all of that now, but uh, the point is that there may be downsides to rapidly increasing population as well. Um, you may want to just kind of keep the population at a level, and it may be the case that it wouldn't be horrific if the population was back at 180 million instead of 400 plus million where it sits today. I'm not sure that there's anything inherently bad about a declining population. So long as the nations or the civilizations continue to uh, maintain the capacity to defend themselves, uh, you know, as long as the declining population, as long as the, the people in power don't feel that the declining population you know, demands a rapid increase in immigration, which seems to be the case now, uh, and uh, also in that section... He, he, there's something here that I'm, I'm, is going to lead me into the next section. He's, he's basically saying, well, you know, there was actually something magnificent about this uh, increase in population. He says, uh, there must have been something extraordinary in, uh, in the 19th century when such harvests of human fruit were produced in its climate. Any preference for the principles which inspired other past ages is frivolous and ridiculous if one does not previously show proof of having realized this magnificent fact and attempted to digest it. You know, there's something magnificent and amazing about uh, about the fact of this population growth. They must have done, I mean, the premise here is that in the 19th century, they must have done something right to be able to see that sort of population explosion. And he, he pins it down, he says... He says, well, such an overwhelming fact forces us, uh, unless we prefer not to use our reason, 
to draw these conclusions. First, that liberal democracy based on technical knowledge is the highest type of public life hitherto known. Because he does, in the paragraph before that, he says, well, um, he says that beyond all possible explaining our way, explaining away, we find ourselves face to face with the fact that by submitting the seed of humanity to the treatment of two principles, liberal democracy and technical knowledge, in a single century, the species in Europe has been triplicated. So that's what he pin, pins it down to, liberal democracy and technical knowledge. So then in this next paragraph, he says, first, liberal democracy based on technical knowledge is the highest type of public life hitherto known. And he says, any, although this might not be the best imaginable type, any type that we're going to imagine as superior to that must preserve the essence of those two principles. And thirdly, to return to any form of existence inferior to that in the 19th century is suicidal. So he's saying that this is, that, that this is the highest type of public life hitherto known, is a life built on liberal democracy and technical knowledge. And we can draw that conclusion from the exploding birth rate. And anything else that we attempt to do that might be better than that are going to have to preserve the essence of liberal democracy and technical knowledge. Now, I have said before, you can't unlearn things. You can't, you, you can't go back to before liberalism and before modernity and just pretend it never happened. I mean, clearly people, everybody knows what happened and you can't just throw out all the scientific knowledge and technical, technological advances completely and pretend it didn't happen. Number one, people aren't willing to do that. And number two, you can't, you just can't unlearn things. But, but he, he, so he really says returning to any form of existence inferior or prior to the 19th century is suicidal. So he says all of that, but then he says, uh, he says if, if that human type, meaning the masses, the mass man, continues to be the master in Europe, 30 years will suffice to send our continent back to barbarism. And this is where I run into the problem because on, on one page, he says this is the greatest type of structures of society that Europe has ever known. And you can tell be, because of the population explosion, right? The fruits of that generation, the fruits of that century were so phenomenal that Europe was able to have this huge increase. And yet... The result of this creates a situation in which Europe, according to him, is 30 years away from barbarism. He says, our, you know, Europe is essentially going to collapse at the, at the hands of barbarians if, if this isn't addressed, if these people continue to be masters. He says, legislative and industrial technique will disappear with the same facility with which so many trade secrets have often disappeared. The whole of life will be contracted. He calls it the vertical invasion of the barbarians. So this is the problem. He lays out this scenario that created this huge population explosion. He says, this is the greatest thing ever. It must be the greatest thing ever, considering the population explosion that it created. And yet, we're 30 years away from descending into barbarism. All of society is damaged. Our capacity to excel, to have proper government, because we've got morons in charge who have not been properly educated. We've got so many people so fast, we haven't been able to educate any of them. And now we're on the verge of suicidal collapse. And yet the very political and technological systems that created this population explosion must be like the greatest thing ever. And that doesn't make a lot of sense. And this is where it's like, okay, this guy is largely considered on the right, but he, as many others, I find, uh, doesn't really, doesn't really want to actually criticize liberalism. It's always a right wing within the constraints of liberalism. 
So even when he sees a situation that is potentially catastrophic and he attributes it as having come directly from liberalism, he's still not able to say, you know, maybe we should rethink this. Maybe this is, seems, seems great on its surface, but really isn't great. Maybe the unintended consequences of liberalism and technological advance, maybe the unintended consequences are actually bad enough that we shouldn't assume it's quite so great as we initially assumed. He won't go that far. And that's what frustrates me about this book. He refuses to really condemn liberalism even at all. So continuing on that line, I want to jump to a point later uh, in the book. In this part here, he says, quote, Every present-day European knows, with a certainty much more forcible than that of all his expressed ideas and opinions, that the European of today must be a liberal. Let us not discuss whether it is this or the other form of liberalism which must be his. I am referring to the fact that the most reactionary of Europeans knows, in the depths of his conscience, that the effort made by Europe in the last century under the name of liberalism is, in the last resort, something inevitable, inexorable, something that Western man today is, whether he likes it or no. Even though it be proved, with full and incontrovertible evidence, that there is falsity and fatality in all the concrete shapes under which the attempt has been made to realize the categorical imperative of political liberty inscribed on the destiny of Europe, the final evidence that in the last century it was right in substance still holds good. The final evidence is present equally in the European communist as in the fascist, whatever attitudes they may adopt to convince themselves to the contrary. All know that beyond all the just criticisms launched against the manifestations of liberalism, there remains its unassailable truth, a truth not theoretic, scientific, intellectual, but of an order radically different and more decisive, namely, a truth of destiny. Theoretic truths not only are disputable, but their whole meaning and force lie in their being disputed. They spring from discussion. They live as long as they are discussed, and they are made exclusively for discussion. But destiny, what from a vital point of view one has to be or has not to be, is not discussed. It is either accepted or rejected. If we accept it, we are genuine. If not, we are the negation, the falsification of ourselves. Destiny does not consist in what we feel like we should do. Rather, is it recognized in its clear features in the consciousness that we must do what we do not feel like doing. Well then, the satisfied man is characterized by his knowing that certain things cannot be, and nevertheless, for that very reason, pretending in act and word to be convinced of the opposite. The fascist will take his stand against political liberty precisely because he knows that in the long run this can never fail, but is inevitably a part of the very substance of European life, and will be returned to when its presence is truly required in the hour of grave crisis." End quote. So that's... You know, that's the section that just bugs me, you know? Like, he basically says, well, you know, everybody knows deep down inside that Europeans must be liberals. Even if they profess to some other thing, communism, fascism, reactionaries, they all know deep down inside that it's their destiny. It's the destiny of Europe to be liberal. He says... Even if it's proven that there's falsity and fatality in the, in the, the manner in which... Uh, political liberty has been attempted to be uh, realized that the destiny remains and he says it's not even up for discussion ideas and perspectives and opinions are all up for discussion and they exist in discussion but destiny transcends discussion it's not even something that uh, is worthy of discussing and so you either accept it in which you're true to yourself or you deny it in which you're false to yourself um I feel like that's just such a to toxic idea. Like, liberalism has huge flaws and has to be discussed. And, you know, like I've said in previous episodes, there's bits and pieces of modernity and technical advance and science and all the other things. And even in democracy, there's good parts of it. Um, and it's not necessarily wise to throw it all out, but it's certainly wise to question every bit of it. 
uh, and to get rid of parts that need to be gotten rid of and to not just turn and accept the whole thing as if it's just destiny and transcends criticism and transcends, I mean, any sort of questioning. That just seems real irresponsible, especially when, you know, you're looking at a situation where, you know, now this was 93 years ago. I mean, he thought Europe was in a suicidal state then. You know, this is before World War II. So, you know, maybe he was, he, he was foreseeing all of that. But now, like, so much of Western Europe just has a pathological suicidal self-loathing. And they're really in inviting foreigners to just replace them. That's their objective. We're just gonna. They're just. They just want to fade away and hand over their continent to foreigners. To mind mindless, self-loathing and and lack of will to lack of will to to succeed as a, as a people. And uh, and to what extent is that the result of the 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 power given to? The masses. I mean, we we look now, and it seems like there's a lot of elites that are driving this sort of um, you know self destruction of Europe. But to what extent is it really just the the mass man mentality? And even if somebody is in is in in an elite position, that doesn't mean that they're not still possessed by the mass man mentality. And how, to what extent are they put in power by the masses? I mean, you have to admit that it's not just elites doing this because there's huge portions of the European population that don't really want to continue on and don't, don't think about his, Europe historically. They think that, it's, that the, the entire civilization is in their hands to do with as they please. There's no obligation to the past. There's no obligation to the next generations. It's all them for them to do with as they want, uh, which sort of gets on to some of the other stuff I'm going to discuss. Let me just, all right. So uh, in this section, he's talking about a little bit more describing the qualities of mass man as, as, as being people who don't feel that they have any restrictions. And think about like other, just other analyses of liberalism that we've looked at where Liberalism really is the unconstrained vision of Thomas Sowell. James Burnham talks also about how the, the liberal mindset is one that people can be anything. There's no constraints. And even uh, Spengler, like when the Faustian worldview, that was sort of, sort of defined by a, a limitlessness of any, anything is possible. You know, there's no constraints on what humans can become. There's no constraints on what their societies can become. There's no constraint to the amount of change that a society can subject itself to. There's just no limits. It's a, it's a mentality of limitlessness. And he talks here about how that sort of limitlessness is, is part of the identity of mass man, the mass man mentality. So here he says, quote, What appearance did life present to that multitudinous man who, in ever-increasing abundance, the 19th century kept producing? To start with, an appearance of universal material ease. Never had the average man been able to solve his economic problem with greater facility. Whilst there was a proportionate decrease of great fortunes and life became harder for the individual worker, the middle classes found their economic horizon widened every day. Every day added a new luxury to their standard of life. Every day their position was more secure and more independent of another's will. What before would have been considered one of fortune's gifts, inspiring humble gratitude toward destiny, was converted into a right, not to be grateful for, but to be insisted on. From 1900 on, the worker likewise begins to extend and assure his existence. Nevertheless, he has to struggle and obtain his end. He does not, like the middle class, find the benefit attentively served up to him by a society and a state which are a marvel of organization. To this ease and security of economic conditions are to be added the physical ones, comfort and public order. Life runs on smooth rails, and there is no likelihood of anything violent or dangerous breaking in on it. Such a free, untrammeled situation was bound to instill into the depths of such souls an idea of existence which might be expressed in the witty and penetrating phrase of an old country like ours, wide is Castile. That is to say, in all its primary and decisive aspects, life presented itself to the new man as exempt from restrictions. 
The realization of this fact, and of its importance, becomes immediate when we remember that such a freedom of existence was entirely lacking to the common man of the past. On the contrary, for them, life was a burdensome destiny, economically and physically. From birth, existence meant to them an accumulation of impediments, which they were obliged to suffer, without possible solution other than to adapt themselves to them, to settle down in the narrow space they left available. But still more evident is the contrast of situations. If we pass from the material to the civil and moral, the average man, from the second half of the 19th century on, finds no social barriers raised against him. That is to say, that as regards the forms of public life, he no longer finds himself from birth confronted with obstacles and limitations. There is nothing to force him to limit his existence. Here again, wide is Castile. There are no estates or castes. There is no civil privileges. The ordinary man learns that all men are equal before the law. Never in the course of history had man been placed in vital surroundings even remotely familiar to those set up by the conditions just mentioned. We are, in fact, confronted with a radical innovation in human destiny, implanted by the 19th century. A new stage has been mounted for human existence, new both in the physical and social aspects. Three principles have made possible this new world, liberal democracy, scientific experiment, and industrialism. The two latter may be summed up in one word, technicism. Not one of those principles was invented in the 19th century. They proceed from the previous two centuries. The glory of the 19th century lies not in their discovery, but in their implantation. No one but recognizes that fact. But it is not sufficient to recognize it in the abstract. It is necessary to realize its inevitable consequences. The 19th century was, of its essence, revolutionary. This aspect is not to be looked for in the scenes of the barricades, which are mere incidents, but in the fact that it placed the average man, the great social mass, in conditions of life radically opposed to those by which he had always been surrounded. It turned his public existence upside down. Revolution is not the uprising against the pre-existing order, but the setting up of a new order contradictory to the traditional one. Hence, there is no exaggeration in saying that the man who is the product of the 19th century is, for the effects of public life, a man apart from all other men. The 18th century man differs, of course, from the 17th century man, and this one in turn from his fellow of the 16th century, but they are all related, similar, even identical in essentials when confronted with this new man. For the common man of all periods, life had principally meant limitation, obligation, dependence, in a word, pressure. Say oppression, if you like, provided it be understood not only in the juridical and social sense, but also in the cosmic. For it is this latter which has never been lacking, up to a hundred years ago, the date at which starts the practically limitless expansion of scientific technique, physical and administrative. Previously, even for the rich and powerful, the world was a place of poverty, difficulty, and danger. The world which surrounds the new man from his birth does not compel him to limit himself in any fashion. It sets up no veto in opposition to him. On the contrary, it incites his appetite, which in principle can increase indefinitely. Now it turns out, and this is the most important, that this world of the 19th and early 20th century not only has the perfections and completeness which it actually possesses, but furthermore suggests to those who dwell in it the radical assurance that tomorrow it will be still richer, ampler, more perfect, as if it enjoyed a spontaneous, inexhaustible power of increase. Even today, in spite of some signs which are making a tiny breach in that sturdy faith, even today there are few men who doubt that motor cars will, in five years' time, be more comfortable and cheaper than today. They believe in this as they believe that the sun will rise in the morning. The metaphor is an exact one, for, in fact, the common man, finding himself in a world so excellent, technically and socially believes that it has been produced by nature, and never thinks of the personal efforts of highly endowed individuals which the creation of this new world presupposes. Still less will he admit the notion that all these facilities still require the support of certain difficult human virtues. 
the least failure of which would cause the rapid disappearance of the whole magnificent edifice. This leads us to note down in our psychological chart of the mass man of today two fundamental traits. The free expansion of his vital desires and therefore of his personality, and his radical ingratitude towards all that has made possible the ease of his existence. These traits together make up the well-known psychology of the spoiled child. And in fact, it would entail no error to use this psychology as a site through which to observe the soul of the masses of today. Heir to an ample and generous past, generous both in ideals and in activities, the new commonalty has been spoiled by the world around it. To spoil means to put no limit on caprice, to give one the impression that everything is permitted to him and that he has no obligations. The young child, exposed to this regime, has no experience of its own limits. By reason of the removal of all external constraint, all clashing with other things, he comes actually to believe that he is the only one that exists, and gets used to not considering others, especially not considering them as superior to himself. This feeling of another's superiority could only be instilled into him by someone who, being stronger than he is, should force him to give up some desire, to restrict himself, to restrain himself. He would then have learned this fundamental discipline. Here I end, and here begins another more powerful than I am. In the world, apparently, there are two people, I myself and none, another superior to me. The ordinary man of past times was daily taught this elemental wisdom by the world about him, because it was a world so rudely organized that catastrophes were frequent, and there was nothing in it certain, abundant, stable. But the new masses find themselves in the presence of a prospect full of possibilities, and furthermore quite secure, with everything ready to their hands, independent of any previous efforts on their part just as we find the sun in the heavens without our hoisting it up on our shoulders. No human being thanks another for the air he breathes, and no one has produced the air for him. It belongs to the sum total of what is there, of what we say it is natural, because it never fails. And these spoiled masses are unintelligent enough to believe that the material and social organization placed at their disposition like the air is of the same origin, since apparently it never fails them and is almost as perfect as the natural scheme of things. My thesis, therefore, is this. The very perfection which the 19th century gave in organization to certain orders of existence has caused the masses benefited thereby to consider it not as an organized but as a natural system. Thus is explained and defined the absurd state of mind revealed by these masses. They are only concerned with their own well-being, and at the same time they remain alien to the cause of that well-being. And as they do not see, behind the benefits of civilization, marvels of invention and construction which can only be maintained by great effort and foresight, they imagine that their role is limited to demanding these benefits peremptorily, as if they were natural rights. In the disturbances caused by scarcity of food, the mob goes in search of bread, and the means it employs is generally to wreck the bakeries. This may serve as a symbol of the attitude adopted, on a greater and more complicated scale, by the masses of today towards the civilization by which they are supported. End quote. All right, so there is a whole lot in that section. Um, that was a long section. That was almost the entirety of chapter 6. Uh, so... The important part here, so he talks about restrictions. He says, you know, some wide is Castile. That must be some Spanish uh, phrase. Uh, but the point is that um, life has presented itself to the new man as exempt from restrictions. And, uh, you know, every day a new luxury added to the standard of life of the people of the 19th century, the appearance of universal material ease. He says... What before would have been considered one of fortune's gifts, inspiring humble gratitude toward destiny, was converted into a right, not to be grateful for, but to be insisted on. Uh, it's just everything is so present and available, and everything just works all the time, that the, just like the sun rising, one just expects it to happen. No one has done it. No one has hoisted the sun up. No one has provi he doesn't thank anyone for the air. No one has provided the air for him. It's just there, 
And so there's an expectation that you just have a right to, to the air, right? Because it's just there. And the same thing with all of the benefits of civilization. It's just kind of there. You don't really think about where it comes from, all the hard work that has gone into maintaining this civilization. It's just something that you, you no longer feel gratitude for this civilization that has been built up by the hard work of people with their, you know, specializing in the particular tasks necessary to make civilization. It becomes something that you can just demand. He says, uh, he says not only in, not only in the technological uh, areas, but also in social areas, there are no barriers from anybody to do anything. They, they can do anything that they want. He says, and he says, three principles have made possible this new world, liberal democracy, scientific exper experiment, and industrialism, and the latter two can be summed up in one word, technicism. So really two basic principles, um, Techno the advance of technology, science and industrial technology, uh, and then liberal democracy. These are the things that have created this, this vast abundance uh, of social uh, capacity and technological capacity. Though he says like the world of common people has been completely turned upside down. It was never the case. So that people in the 18th, 17th, 16th centuries, they all lived, lived according to limitations in their what they could do they they just had to accept and find a way to get in to fit in to you know go along to get along or what have you they had to just accept that the limitations that were imposed upon them but the modern man has no limitations that he has to accept and that and the premise is that something is done to one's psychology when there are no limitations that people need some limitations in their life in order to like and he talks about raising children a little bit i think that's probably pretty uh relevant that especially children they need to have someone somewhere tell them no right you can't just you know and that's why he basically calls them spoiled children that's the the phrase that he uses he says that the the psychological chart of the mass man of today is uh, can be described with two fundamental traits. The first of those is the free expansion of his vital desires and therefore of his personality. Um, I, I think that that's like the the expectation of what one is owed just grows and grows. One's appetites just grow and grow and grow. It's never enough. There's always more that you want because, you know, the only con the only constraint is you don't have enough money. And any sort of constraint on what you want is see, it feels like some kind of oppression that you're you know you're you're being oppressed by not having enough access to this that and the other thing that somehow like you deserve more um the this expansion of desires and the second being radical ingratitude toward everything that has made possible the ease of existence he says these traits together make up the well-known psychology of the spoiled child he says to spoil means to put no limit on caprice to give one the impression that everything is permitted to him and that he has no obligations this is the mindset of the spoiled child. This is the mindset of the mass man. And we see this in the world, of course, people just in the modern world. I mean, if this was the case in 1930, it's only doubly, triply so the case today. There's no, people have no concept of having obligations. It's only, we only ever hear about people's rights, right to this, right to that, you know. Um, endless desires, total ingratitude, you know, all of the work that has been done to create civilization is all comprised of, you know, the patriarchy or white supremacy or what have you, the various things that have built. And that it, it's it even, you know, I mean, that's not just to say um, like minorities or women, but, you know, white men, everybody, every, almost everybody has this sort of attitude that this this is just the way things are and there's no there you don't owe anything to the world you don't owe anything to your civilization you don't owe anything to your society or your country it's just like what can i get what can i get what can i get spoiled children 
He says the spoiled masses are unintelligent enough to believe that the material and social organizations placed at their disposition, like the air, is of the same origin. And then the last part, when he, he says that um, in the disturbances caused by scarcity of food, the mob goes in search of bread, and the means it employs is generally to wreck the bakeries. That serves as a symbol of the attitude adopted, right? No, no appreciation for the work that the baker go, does to create bread. No appreciation for all the systems that provide the baker with his resources. I didn't get my bread. It's the baker's fault. So with that uh, commentary on the on the elimination of limitation, I want to jump to another part towards the end of the book. Um, this part not particularly long. But here he's talking about nation states. And he says, he says the loss, quote, the loss of prestige by parliaments has nothing to do with their notorious defects. It proceeds from another cause entirely foreign to them, considered as political instruments. It arises from the fact that the European does not know in what to utilize them, has lost respect for the traditional aims of public life. In a word, cherishes no illusion about the national states in which he finds himself circumscribed and a prisoner. If this much talked of loss of prestige is looked into a little carefully, what is seen is that the citizen no longer feels any respect for his state, either in England, Germany, or France. It would be useless to make a change in the detail of institutions because it is not these which are unworthy of respect, but the state itself which has become a puny thing. For the first time, the European, checked in his projects, economic, political, intellectual, by the limits of his own country, feels that those projects, that is to say his vital possibilities, are out of proportion to the size of the collective body in which he is enclosed. And so he has discovered that to be English, German, or French is to be provincial. He has found out that he is less than he was before, for previously the Englishmen the Frenchman and the German believed, each for himself, that he was the universe. This is, to my mind, the true source of that feeling of decadence which today afflicts the European. It is therefore a source which is purely spiritual and is also paradoxical, inasmuch as the presumption of decadence springs precisely from the fact that his capacities have increased and find themselves limited by an old organization, within which there is no room for them. To give some support for what I have been saying, let us take any concrete activity, the making of motor cars, for example. The motor car is a purely European invention. Nevertheless, today, the North American product is superior. Conclusion, the European motor car is in decadence. And yet, the European manufacturer of motors knows quite well that the superiority of the American product does not arise from any specific virtue possessed by the men overseas but simply from the fact that the American can offer his product free from restrictions to a population of 120 million. Imagine a European factory seeing before it a market comprised of all the European states with their colonies and protectorates. No one doubts that a car designed for 500 or 600 million customers would be much better and much cheaper than the Ford. All the virtues peculiar to American technique are almost of a certainty effects and not causes of the scope and homogeneity of the market. The rationalization of industry is an automatic consequence of the size of the market. The real situation of Europe would then appear to be this. Its long and splendid past has brought it to a new stage of existence where everything has increased. But at the same time, the institutions surviving from that past are dwarfed and have become an obstacle to expansion. Europe has been built up in the form of small nations. In a way, the idea and the sentiment of nationality have been her most characteristic invention, and now she finds herself obliged to exceed herself. This is the outline of the enormous drama to be staged in the coming years. Will she be able to shake off these survivals, or will she remain forever their prisoner? Because it has already happened once before in history that a great civilization has died through not being able to adopt a substitute for its traditional idea of the state, end quote. So this is, seems like, as I'm reading it, it really sounds 
like an argument that the European has outgrown the existence of the nation state, whereas once it was sufficient to be English or French or German, now for economic reasons, in order to be able to put put out a superior motor car, you know, they have to have open open market to be able to sell their cars to anybody in in Europe and all the European protectorates and colonies and have this 500, 600 million person market that they can sell the cars to. And through this giant market, right, they can make better cars. And therefore, like, it's it's time for Europe to transcend its, you know, restrictive prison-like nation states and move to a new conception of the state that is all-encompassing. So it's like it's like the uh, you know the the early stages of the European Union, this pan-European market. And uh, I don't know if I, I feel like any of his argument makes much sense when combined with with this statement in here, because you're just talking about reducing barriers, reducing limitations, opening up more horizons, homogenizing more people, making more people more inclined to all speak the same language, to all have the same car. You know, it's just uh, more more elimination of distinction and separation from one people to another, which doesn't seem like it makes any sense in coordination with the rest of his arguments uh, about but you know that's where like the whole problem of the book lies that he says the, you know well you know liberalism and technological advance it really is the greatest thing ever um, and we really do need to keep moving in this direction but somehow we have to come to terms with the fact that all of this is also simultaneously like you know, potentially annihilating our civilization, but we're not actually going to walk any of it back. We're just going to kind of comment on it while we do it. And that's what kind of irritates me about this. Like, walk it back a little bit. Maybe the mass man uh, is not the right move. And maybe if the homogenization of all the European nations into sort of one state, one culture is just enhancing the mass man, making more mass men, like, dial it back a little bit. But there's no real dial it back in here anywhere, which is, which it just seems like a description rather than any sort of a solution. And that's what I find frustrating. Anyway, uh, moving along here uh, to one more point when he is talking about Uh, direct action and violence and uh, and unreasonable behavior. He says, quote, Under the species of syndicalism and fascism, there appears for the first time in Europe a type of man who does not want to give reasons or to be right, but simply shows himself resolved to impose his opinions. This is the new thing the right to not be reasonable, the reason of unreason. Here I see the most palpable manifestation of the new mentality of the masses, due to their having decided to rule society without the capacity for doing so. In their political conduct, the structure of the new mentality is revealed in the rawest, most convincing manner. But the key to it lies in intellectual hermeticism. The average man finds himself with ideas in his head, but he lacks the faculty of ideation. He has no conception, even of the rare atmosphere in which ideas live. He wishes to have opinions, but is unwilling to accept the conditions and presuppositions that underlie all opinion. Hence, his ideas are, in effect, nothing more than appetites in words, something like musical romances. To have an idea means believing one is in possession of the reasons for having it, and consequently means believing that there is such a thing as reason, a world of intelligible truths. To have ideas, to form opinions, is identical with appealing to such an authority, submitting oneself to it, accepting its code and its decisions, and therefore believing that the highest form of intercommunion 
is the dialogue in which the reasons for our ideas are discussed. But the mass man would feel himself lost if he accepted discussion, and instinctively repudiates the obligation of accepting that supreme authority lying outside himself. Hence, the new thing in Europe is to have done with discussions, and detestation is expressed for all forms of intercommunion which imply acceptance of objective standards, ranging from conversation to parliament and taking in science. This means that there is a renunciation of the common life based on culture, which is subject to standards, and a return to the common life of barbarism. All the normal processes are suppressed in order to arrive directly at the imposition of what is desired. The hermeticism of the soul, which, as we have seen before, urges the mass to intervene in the whole of public life, also inevitably leads it to one single process of intervention, direct action. When the reconstruction of the origins of our epic is undertaken, it will be observed that the first notes of its special harmony were sounded in those groups of French syndicalists and realists of about 1900, inventors of the method and the name of direct action. Man has always had recourse to violence. Sometimes this recourse was a mere crime and does not interest us here, but at other times violence was the means resorted to by him who had previously exhausted all others in defense of the rights of justice which he thought he possessed. It may be regrettable that human nature tends on occasion to this form of violence, but it is undeniable that it implies the greatest tribute to reason and justice, for this form of violence is none other than reason exasperated. Force was, in fact, the last resort. Rather stupidly, it has been the custom to take ironically this expression, which clearly indicates the previous submission of force to methods of reason. Civilization is nothing else than the attempt to reduce force to being the last resort. We are now beginning to realize this with startling clearness, because direct action consists in inverting the order and proclaiming violence as first resort, or strictly as the only resort. It is the norm which proposes the annulment of all norms, which suppresses all intermediate process between our purpose and its execution. It is the magna charta of barbarism. It is well to recall that at every epoch, when the mass, for one purpose or another, has taken part in public life, it has been in the form of direct action. This was then the natural modus operandi of the masses. And the thesis of this essay is strongly confirmed by the patent fact that at present, when the overruling intervention in public life of the masses has passed from casual and infrequent to being the normal, it is direct action which appears officially as the recognized method. End quote. All right, so that section wasn't quite as long as some of the others, but simply talking about how the force has and the rejection of reason and the simple imposition of one's will has become the standard uh, operation of the mass man. The mass man is capable of defending his positions and feels uncomfortable being expected to defend his positions, has decided that the era of discussion is over and now it is time for direct action. And while he describes it as violence, I think if you think about our world, uh, what we see is the utilization of the levers of power. So uh, it's not necessarily the case that we're going to sit and, and, and discuss whether it's you know trans ideology or uh, critical race theory or critical theory in general, what have you, various progressive ideas. It's just not, it's not really the case that this is the sort of thing that we're going to sit and debate. It's the, the idea is that, you know, nobody is obligated to educate you. You need to go educate yourself. Uh, in the meantime, we're just going to sort of impose it. Uh, but, you know, should conservatives or the right attempt to just impose anything, um, you know, hands are up in the air and, and people are screaming about fascism. But, you know, people need to understand that if that's the nature of the game, then that's the nature of the game. And there's, to some extent, 
you know, problem here where one side is trying to impose its will and the other side is trying to have a debate. Uh, the side that's trying to have a debate is going to lose because they're not using the levers of power. They're not imposing their will. It's a contest of wills. If one side of a dispute attempts to impose its will, the other side of the dispute must, in response, impose its own will. Or eventually, one side will win and the other side will lose. Nothing is determined by argument. That's not to say that there should be no um, attempts to make logical arguments for those people who are still open to argument and are participating in argument, but there's a huge contingent which is just bent on imposing itself, has decided that they have the moral high ground, that they have, you know, the future belongs to them, and they are on the right side of history, and they have this just this moral justification for imposing their will. And th those folks are not interested in argument or reasoning or rationality or anything. They've made up their minds. They're no longer engaged in discussion. And so long as you're attempting to engage in, in an argument, um, you're behind the times. You need to participate in the world as it is. And if it has become a conflict of will, then that's the nature of the beast. So that was really all I wanted to say about that. Like, that's where we are. That's where we've been. I mean, this is, again, almost 100 years ago. Wake up, get caught up. Many of the reasons for conservative losses over the past 100 years, why we haven't been able to hang on to the civilization in the form that we want, and we continually get, you know, progressive agendas shoved down our throat is because we're not willing to impose our will. We think it's barbaric. We think it's le a lesser form of civilization, and maybe it is, but that's the arena that we're in, you know? Just got to get with the program. So then this next section here uh, kind of harkens back to some of the other stuff that I read, but I like the way he puts it. He's talking about nature and civilization. He says, quote, Nature is always with us. It is self-supporting. In the forests of nature, we can be savages with impunity. We can likewise resolve never to cease being so without further risk than the coming of other people who are not savages. But in principle, it is possible to have peoples who are perennially primitive. Bracig has called these the peoples of perpetual dawn, those who have remained in a motionless, frozen twilight, which never progresses towards midday. This is what happens in the world which is mere nature. But it does not happen in the world of civilization, which is ours. Civilization is not just there. It is not self-supporting. It is artificial and requires the artist or the artisan. If you want to make use of the advantages of civilization but are not prepared to concern yourself with the upholding of civilization, you are done. In a trice, you find yourself left without civilization. Just a slip, and when you look around, everything has vanished into air. The primitive forest appears in its native state just as if curtains covering pure nature had been drawn back. The jungle is always primitive and vice versa. Everything primitive is mere jungle. The romantics of every period have been excited by these scenes of violation in which the natural and infrahuman assaults the white form of woman, and they have depicted Leda and the swan, Pasiphae and the bull, and Tiope and the goat, generalizing the picture they have found a more subtly indecent spectacle in the landscape with ruins, where the civilized geometric stone is stifled beneath the embrace of wild vegetation. When your good romantic catches sight of a building, the first thing his eyes seek is the yellow hedge mustard on cornice and roof. This proclaims that in the long run, everything is earth, that the jungle springs up everywhere anew. It would be stupid to laugh at the romantic. The romantic also is in the right. Under these innocently perverse images, there lies an immense, ever-present problem, that of the relations between civilization and what lies behind it, 
nature, between the rational and the cosmic. I reserve then the right to deal with this subject on another occasion, and to be a romantic myself at an opportune moment, but just now I am engaged in a contrary task. It is a question of keeping back the invading jungle. The good European must at present busy himself with something similar to what caused grave concern to the Australian states, how to prevent the prickly pear from gaining ground and driving man into the sea. Sometime in the 40s, a Mediterranean emigrant, homesick for his native scenery, Malaga, Sicily, took with him to Australia a pot with a wretched little prickly pear. Today, the Australian budgets are weighed down with the burden of charges for the war against the prickly pear, which has invaded the continent and each year advances over a square kilometer of ground. The mass man believes that the civilization into which he was born and which he makes use of is as spontaneous and self-producing as nature, and ipso facto he is changed into a primitive man. For him, civilization is the forest. This I have said before, now I have to treat it in more detail. The principles on which the civilized world, which has to be maintained, is based, simply do not exist for the average man of today. He has no interest in the basic cultural values, no solidarity with them, he is not prepared to place himself at their service. How has this come about? For many reasons, but for the moment I am only going to stress one. Civilization becomes more complex and difficult in proportion as it advances. The problems which it sets before us today are of the most intricate. The number of people whose minds are equal to these problems becomes increasingly smaller. The post-war period offers us a striking example of this. The reconstruction of Europe, as we are seeing, is an affair altogether too algebraical, and the ordinary European is showing himself below this high enterprise. It is not that means are lacking for the solution, what are lacking are heads, or rather there are some heads, very few, but the average mass of Central Europe is unwilling to place them on its shoulders. This disproportion between the complex subtlety of the problems and the minds that should study them will become greater if a remedy be not found, and it constitutes the basic tragedy of our civilization. By reason of the very fertility and certainty of its formative principles, its production increases in quantity and in subtlety so as to exceed the receptive powers of normal man. I do not think that this has ever happened in the past. All previous civilizations have died through the insufficiency of their underlying principles. That of Europe is beginning to succumb for the opposite reason. In Greece and Rome, it was not man that failed, but principles. The Roman Empire came to an end for lack of technique. When it reached a high level of population, and this vast community demanded the solution of certain material problems, which technique only could furnish, the ancient world started on a process of involution, retrogression, and decay. But today, it is man who is the failure, because he is unable to keep pace with the progress of his own civilization. It is painful to hear relatively cultured people speak concerning the most elementary problems of the day. They seem like rough farmhands trying with thick, clumsy fingers to pick up a needle lying on a table. Political and social subjects, for example, are handled with the same rude instruments of thought which served 200 years since to tackle situations in effect 200 times less complex." End quote. Uh, so, uh, he's... Here he's talking about a couple things that I want to mention. He's really talking about nature versus civilization. Um, so first of all, this, this premise that there's nature and then there's civilization, and if you stop upholding civilization, uh, it, it comes crashing down and, and nature takes over. Um, there's a basic truth in that. And, but I think that in today's world, uh, we have to acknowledge some other things. Well, he, he, I mean, he really says the problem is that civilization is becoming so complex and complicated that people can't keep up with it. People can't, aren't able to, they don't have the capacity, the mental capacity to be able to deal with these everly, ever increasingly complex 
situations and problems that civilization finds itself in. And the tools at their disposal, their mental disposal, are just too basic and primitive to deal with complex problems of civilization. Okay, I, I'll, I'll grant him that. But I also think that in, in the modern world, the simple opposition of nature and civilization uh, is not adequate because, you know, the technology just advances and advances. And there is such a thing as going too far in, you know, the technological direction that everything becomes civilized, everything becomes developed, everything becomes built, constructed, everything becomes made out of plastic. I mean, he, he was writing almost 100 years ago. Now we have new problems and many of our new problems arise because we've gone so far uh, into what we describe as civilization that we are just overwhelmed in some cases with technology and we begin to move towards transhumanism and we begin to move towards environmental degradation and uh, homogenization of all of the world and the elimination of um, you know heterogeneous individual cultures and their traditions it's everything is steamrolled everything is plowed up and and replaced with pavement everything is made uniform technological and you know in its own way barren and so the concept of civilization now in the modern world i believe must involve more of a sense of a eudaimonian golden mean an aristotelian golden mean uh where there's nature on the one hand and then there's like total technological dominance on the other and you really have to find a sort of middle ground where you're in a sustainable symbiotic relationship with nature and not just totally bound up to technology because you think that you know it's it's technology versus nature and you have to you have to fight hard on the side of technology or else you return to barbarism um, you know a middle ground must be found and so the the you know he talks about the romantics um, and he says, you know, that in a sense, the romantics are really right. And he says, he says he reserves the right to deal with the subject on another occasion and to be a romantic himself. But right now, it's a matter of keeping back the invading jungle. Um, I, I don't have the book where he's taking a more romantic perspective, but I think that the, the romantics and the appreciation of nature um, that was a part of the romantic movement is valuable and probably has a place in the thought of the right. So there's that that I wanted to say. But really what is interesting is when he talks about, uh, he says, um, the mass man believes that the civilization into which he was born and which he makes use of is as spontaneous and self-producing as nature. And ipso facto, he's changed into a primitive man. For him, civilization is the forest. Civilization is the forest for the modern man. It is self is self growing, spontaneously appearing. Um, if you riot, burn down your city, smash all the windows, light all the cars on fire, just wait around a little bit, and it will all spontaneously fix itself. Right? You can smash whatever you want. the The civilization fairy is going to show up and rebuild it for you. It's like the forest. You're just there. You don't have to plant the trees in the forest. You don't have to cultivate the forest. It's just there for you. You just pick apples off trees whenever you want, right? And that if you view civilization that way, that all this stuff is just there and you can like it or dislike it. You can defecate on the sidewalk if you want to. Somebody's going to come along and clean it up. Throw the litter out of your car window. Somebody's going to come along and clean it up. You know, civilization itself, like the, the civilization elves, you know, are going to come out of the woodwork when nobody's looking and clean it all up and rebuild stuff. You know, I mean, that's he that's the mindset of the primitive. He says, he says, ipso facto, he's changed into a primitive man by believing that. And he's not talking about like immigration from third world countries. He's talking about European mass man 
not understanding that civilization comes with it. It includes obligations that people do the work to hold the whole thing up. Nobody's going to do it for you. They, you have to do. If you're not willing to do the work, it will all come crashing down. I like I like that notion. And then you then you consider, you know, immigration from the third world. People don't have the level of complexity of civilization that we have here in the West, and they have hostile attitudes towards it anyway. You know, so they'll show up and they'll get like a hotel room or something in, in Europe they, they house these migrants in hotels and they show up and you get a hotel room and then it's like oh this hotel room's too small you know how am I supposed to raise a family here where's the house I need a seven room house for my giant family you know the civilization elves are just going to build a house for you you know you don't have to actually do anything for it no, no, no one has to do anything. That some, and but the problem is, there's there are people who consider themselves the civilization elves, and they're out picking up other people's litter, and they're keeping everything on the up and up. You know, they're doing all the. But, I mean, are you just other people's maids? You know, civilization can't function like that. The last part I'm going to read here is when he talks about the need for struggle in life. And he says, quote, this type which at present is to be found everywhere and everywhere imposes his own spiritual barbarism is in fact the spoiled child of human history. The spoiled child is the heir who behaves exclusively as a mere heir. In this case, the inheritance is civilization with its conveniences, its security, in a word with all its advantages. As we have seen, it is only in circumstances of easy existence, such as our civilization has produced, that a type can arise marked by such a collection of features inspired by such a character. It is one of a number of deformities produced by luxury in human material. There might be a deceptive tendency to believe that a life born into a world of plenty should be better, more really a life, than one which consists in a struggle against scarcity. Such is not the case for reasons of the strictest and most fundamental nature, which this is not the place to enlarge upon. For the present, instead of those reasons, it is sufficient to recall the ever-recurrent fact which constitutes the tragedy of every hereditary aristocracy. The aristocrat inherits, that is to say, he finds attributed to his person conditions of life which he has not created, and which therefore are not produced in organic union with his personal individual existence. At birth, he finds himself installed, suddenly and without knowing how, in the midst of his riches and his prerogatives. In his own self, he has nothing to do with them, because they do not come from him. They are the giant armor of some other person, some other human being, his ancestor. And he has to live as an heir, that is to say, he has to wear the trappings of another existence. What does this bring us to? What life is the aristocrat, by inheritance, going to lead? his own, or that of his first noble ancestor, neither one nor the other. He is condemned to represent the other man, consequently to be neither that other nor himself. Inevitably, his life loses all authenticity and is transformed into pure representation or fiction of another life. The abundance of resources that he is obligated to make use of gives him no chance to live out his own personal destiny. His life is atrophied. All life is the struggle, the effort to be itself. The difficulties which I meet with in order to realize my existence are precisely what awaken and mobilize my activities, my capacities. If my body was not a weight to me, I should not be able to walk. If the atmosphere did not press on me, I should feel my body as something vague, flabby, insubstantial. So, in the aristocratic air, his whole individuality grows vague, for lack of use and vital effort. The result is that specific stupidity of our old nobility, which is unlike anything else, a stupidity which, strictly speaking, has never yet been described in its intimate tragic mechanism, that tragic mechanism which leads all hereditary aristocracy to irremediable degeneration. 
so much merely to counteract our ingenuous tendency to believe that a superabundance of resources favors existence. Quite the contrary. A world superabundant in possibilities automatically produces deformities, vicious types of human life, which may be brought under the general class, the airman, of which the aristocrat is only one particular case, the spoiled child another, and the mass man of our time more fully, more radically, a third. It would moreover be possible to make more detailed use of this last allusion to the aristocrat by showing how many of his characteristic traits in all times and among all peoples germinate in the mass man. For example, his propensity to make out of games and sports the central occupation of his life, the cult of the body, hygienic regime and attention to dress, lack of romance in his dealings with women, his amusing himself with the intellectual while at bottom despising him and at times ordering his flunkies or his bravos to chastise him, his preference for living under an absolute authority rather than under regime of free discussion, etc. I persist then, at the risk of boring the reader, in making the point that this man full of uncivilized tendencies, this newest of the barbarians, is an automatic product of modern civilization, especially of the form taken by this civilization in the 19th century. He has not burst in on the civilized world from outside like the great white barbarians of the 5th century. Neither has he been produced within it by spontaneous, mysterious generation, as Aristotle says of the tadpoles in the pond. He is its natural fruit. One may formulate as follows a law confirmed by paleontology and biogeography. Human life has arisen and progressed only when the resources it could count on were balanced by the problems it met with. End quote. So that's just a, a little bit about the need for uh, struggle, conflict, problems, challenges in order to allow a person to you know become their greatest self or to develop as a person a little bit in contrast with the trial of air that we saw um, interestingly the AIR the trial of air as in the air you breathe back in Julius Evola's handbook for right-wing youth this one's talking about the air H-E-I-R the air to something that one didn't earn um, but similar but opposed where uh, Evola was saying, well, you know, if you don't have anything to oppose yourself to, you still need to have something you stand for. You still need to have something that you can present as your positive vision for the world, not just, I want to take down those people, I want to oppose those people, I'm against this, I'm against that, but speaking up for what you believe in and what you have of your own without having any opposition. Um, it's not entirely the same obviously, but um, Ortega here is talking about how you need uh, struggle, you need opposition, you need problems, you need challenges in order to overcome those challenges, in order to, um, you know, like like lifting weights, you, you, you need resistance. You need, whether it's, you know, your body mass or, or, or barbells, you need some kind of weight to work against you, you know? You have to push against something. You have to have resistance in order to build your muscle mass. And the same is goes for your mind. You have to challenge your mind in order to really like improve your mind. And your life situation, your civilizational situation, every aspect of your being, you know, requires some sort of challenge or struggle in order to become yourself. And he talks about the hereditary aristocracy where someone just is born into this family of great wealth and um you know they're they're not ever really challenged to make it in the world and therefore they never really develop into their full potential they're always just sort of everything is easy like when everything is easy that's what he says he says you know on first glance you might think that when everything is easy that's a life that's a great life oh, I, everything is easy for me what a great life but you can't really become yourself if you don't face any sort of struggle in life if you don't in some way have to work in life to, to get to get things done to have you know goals and objectives that you have to 
you know, struggle through. So um, that's kind of like the same thing as the spoiled child who's given everything that they want. Nobody ever tells no, tells them no. That doesn't develop good people. P- people aren't raised that way. They don't become good people when they're when they're spoiled as children. They don't develop into their greatest personas. They don't develop strength of character. And the more we do that to our entire civilization, where no one has to struggle for, I mean, it's like that the movie, uh, I think the movie is, is Wally, where there's people of the future and they're like, they're all kind of obese and they're sitting in these floating chairs. Nobody really ever walks anywhere because the chair floats around. And, you know, it seems like they've got their, you know, their burgers and, 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 and soft drinks, like just pop out of nowhere or something. They never have to do anything to, to get like the good yummy sugary fatty food that they want and you know their senses are all kind of amused they got their tv shows they're watching their sports ball and their little tv screen that goes where they go and and there's no effort involved from any of them ever seem to really struggle with anything and it's like the perfect existence of perfect comfort you know like what a comfortable world you never have to even walk it's all provided for you and yet you know, I think most people, when they watch it, they see something like tragically pathetic about it, right? I mean, that's certainly not any person reaching their potential. Anyway, um, that's all I'm going to say about this episode, about this book. Clearly, this is a nice long episode, but there was a lot of stuff in here. I wanted to cover. So thanks for sticking with it for so long and I'll catch you on the flip side.